Hello, everyone. These things? Yeah, yeah I know. Hello, hello, hello. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Pretend we're at a great show, and you've got some fabulous artists, which we do happen to have, artists in their own right, which I'm going to introduce you to in a second. Um, this is the panel on international touring and booking. If you think it's something else, you're more than welcome to stay. Just make your questions relevant. So the way this is going to operate is we're going to talk. Um, we have a few questions we're going to toss out. I'm going to toss out to the panel. They're going to talk. They're going to converse amongst themselves. We're going to leave 20 minutes at the end for questions. If you, and I'll let you know when that moment begins, and then you all can line up here at this microphone. And I will remind you at that time that please keep your question to a single one-part question, not a two-part. Um, if you want to say your name, that's fine, but that's all you need to say is your name. I don't want to know where you're from or what you do and what album you've got coming out. So those are my ground rules. She's tough. <laughs> well, only because we want to get to the meat. Everyone is going to learn something out of today. What that is, is going to be dependent upon hearing what they have to say and hearing what the people who walk up to the microphone have to say. So with that, let's get started. My name is Karen Kennedy. And thank you, thank you. I have the pleasure of, of working in a great institution called Jazz, which we are all here for. And because we, I think, have a love for art and for the expression of beauty and the sharing of soul and connection, that's why we're here and we're gonna talk about how we can do that on an international basis. So we're going to start by introducing Noah Simon from the United Talent Agency. <laughs> Next to him is Catherine McVicker, who we all know as one of the um, leaders in, in, in jazz and in how we should conduct ourselves as professionals. Wow. That's a lot to live up to. Well, you're living it, my dear. You're living it. And, and next to Catherine is Fritz Tom from Vienne Jazz Festival. Hello. So with that, we're gonna get started. I'm going to uh, rely upon what my mother calls your contraption. <laughs> and uh, which is great, because she's right. Um, let's, let's start by throwing out a couple questions. I'm gonna sit down. Um, but right now, it's comfortable to stand. So let's start with, what are a couple of, of key points that are important for either an artist or a manager or an agent to know before you even contact a venue, whether that's a festival or a club or any kind of programmer or producer? What are a couple of key points? And I'd like to start with Catherine. Well, I'd like to start by saying that I can't put enough emphasis on the word business in the music business. And so when you're approaching a venue or a promoter or a festival, I think it's really smart to think like the promoter and to try to think about what does the promoter need in order to um, consider my artist for a concert. Have I researched this festival? Do I know the kind of music that they present? Do I understand the size venues so I have a sense of how much money they may have in their budget? And am I confident about my artist's ability to help this promoter succeed financially? I really don't want to hear somebody tell me that they have a great band. You're supposed to be good, you know? So it's really about the business part of it. And I think you really um, will have a better um, relationship and more success if you think more like the promoter. Would you agree with that, Fritz? Well, I mean, doing business or so any kind of uh, transaction with somebody, it's always good uh, to get the pace of the person you want to interact. So, of course, you know, it's good to put on the, the promoter's uh, head and think, uh, you know, like what would be making most sense of it. And uh, uh, it's a lot of, uh, of uh, bits and pieces, of course, that, uh, that play into the game. Uh, but uh, like the philosophical essence, I would say, is that what you mentioned. Closer to the mic, 
so uh, maybe to mention at that at that point uh, uh, for the my festival is in Vienna in Austria. We have a partner festival in Vienna in France, which is just you know sometimes artists have been mixing it up and going to France instead of Austria or audience and also vice versa. Uh, but uh, uh, you know we have uh, sixteen. Uh, associate festivals from, I welcome my colleague and longtime friend Carlo Pagnotta here, and uh, uh, we have uh, uh, in Europe and in North America the major festivals under an umbrella. And uh, uh, so we know, like, we have different formats and everything, but we know some sort of a uh, lot of approaches and a lot of thinking. And uh, while we've been discussing uh, uh, before I had, you know, some points that would be of an interest. You know, I mentioned one thing. Uh, we know already the agent uh, and the musician or the artist have been uh, uh, trying to put on the promoters or the presenter's head and try to think uh, what could be most appealing. Uh, one of the essential things is how to get in touch. And then uh, what I mentioned uh, is a, a significant point uh, the email should be very short. It should be uh, as uh, small in uh, capacity as possible because otherwise it's caught in the filter or the, the poor uh, festival promoter is opening his uh, up to 1,000 emails a day and sees, wow, there's a mail here with 25 megabytes, you know, and this is, of course, very time-consuming to dig through it, you know. It sounds very easy, maybe, or very naive, but, you know, it's, it's all about the whole life and all interaction about uh, essential things. And this is, of course, you know, like a first impression before you get then, of course, into the mail and have very interesting links and video clips and so on uh, to get a picture of what, uh, what, uh, what uh, the artist is about, no? So keep it short and sweet, is what you're saying, but to, yes, the, point. to the point. And I think something else that's pretty important to consider from an artist's perspective is just looking in the mirror and asking yourself, are you ready to play this festival? And you know, I think that's a, a difficult question to answer sometimes, but researching past lineups and running orders of this festival, identifying the stage that you think you belong on, looking at the artists who played the specific slot that you see yourself or your artist performing on, having an opinion about that and being as detailed as possible um, going in will give the buyers and the programmers a bit more clarity and vision on where to place your music. So uh, being as educated about the actual festival, the vibe, the direction it's heading in, how, how it is evolving um, is, is very important. So that brings us to the idea of research. You have to do your homework, not just about yourself, about and how you present yourself about who you're presenting yourself to, which, which is sort of key. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about, you know, particularly you, Fitz, I'm sorry. Um, what do you look for in terms of uh, presenting new artists or new artists or even established artists? What, what are you looking for when, um, what, what piques your interest? What makes you say, okay, I've got that in a little short email. Why do I want to learn more about this person? Well, I mean, new things are always, of course, very interesting, and we have to consider that, uh, uh, say, the artists that are known, the audience uh, buys ticket, uh, tickets uh, uh, that are established and so on, uh, they all, uh, you know, shift either, I mean, these days I have to say, uh, up to the rock and roll circuit and rock festivals sometimes, naming like Kamasi Washington or whomever, uh, Jacob Collier maybe, you know, still one of your clients. And, uh, and, uh, but we need, of course, some new artists uh, uh, besides, you know, being the, 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 curi the curiosity and the curious element. We're all music lovers and we always look for something new and interesting and interesting uh, uh, presentations, interesting uh, formats and so on. Uh, so that's always, of course, a very important thing. But uh, 
uh, one thing we have to have in mind always, which is to finance our, uh, it's huge cost, you know, to put a festival on the stage, on multiple stages and so on. So of course, uh, uh, the whole uh, programming is very much artist driven as well. No? So one side artist driven, you know, because you need uh, to need the names to draw the media attention and uh, and uh, you know the audience attention and boost the ticket sales, and then of course the new elements because always the question is as well asked, what is new and is this new and who had been winning the own competition and who is this and that who is coming up who played at this. Uh, uh, festivals and we exchange, you know, at our festival meetings always uh, what is interesting uh, to uh, present and what uh, went very well for the very first time at the festival and and so this is how it's uh, it's building up, you know, and the program is shaping up and how the promoter's interest is, uh, you know, going to put into into action and into festival programs. Mm. It's a good point. I mean, there's there's always kind of the question of what do you focus on more, the art or the personality behind the art? And I think in jazz more so than other genres, there's this kind of intimate connection between the two where it's like, of course, you got to press play on the music. You know, that's going to be your instinct, right? You got to press play and just close your eyes and let it sink in. But when you're listening to jazz, it's almost like you're imagining what the live expression of that music is quicker than maybe other other genres. It's like you put on a trap song by Lil Uzi Vert and you're not really thinking about, oh, I need to see that DJ turn that knob. And, and <laughs> you know, you're just not really thinking about that. But with jazz, it's much more intimate and you almost actively want to see the expression of it. And so I look at the music first as an art form, but I think the person behind it is is very, very important. And then presenting themselves in a good way is also key. So related to that, you have an, if you have a new artist who no one has heard of, but you have committed to helping break this artist, how do you approach a producer or a presenter to tell what is going to be engaging about that narrative that's going to get their attention? How do you do that as an agent? That's where the strategy comes in. And Catherine and I were speaking about this just before. It's so important, especially in the jazz world, to take a kind of long-term approach to building an artist and not just throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks, because that doesn't really work with jazz music, you know? You have to be very direct and precise and have an opinion and have taste and know where to present something. And so when you take an artist that you're passionate about as an agent, it's almost like you're their manager, you're their caretaker, you're really invested emotionally in them, especially in the early days because they're not making, you know, 10% of nothing is still nothing. Um, so with somebody like Jacob Collier, for example, in, in on his first ever tour, it was like, which venue do I want to see Jacob in? And why do I think that would be a success? And then it's me going out to that venue and saying, this is why I think it would work only here. You know, instead of playing Mercury Lounge in New York City, we went to Joe's Pub and did two nights there. Why? Because I felt that a seated audience and the size of the stage and the whole kind of vibe around the venue and its reputation would just kind of be a perfect way to present him for the first time. So I think when you're working with an artist that isn't necessarily worth anything yet, it takes that much more strategy and taste behind it in the, in the early stages. I think that's really true. And I think as well that it's really important for you to understand, you um, people who want to do this kind of touring internationally, there's a number of different things to understand. First of all, every country is different. So it, and there are tastes in music that are very different. I also think that people who have been around in the industry for a while, as I have been, have seen a dramatic change in the industry. When I started working and booking artists in Europe, um, you know, it was almost essential to have an American and pref preferably, frankly, a black American um, musician on their festival because that gave the authenticity of being a jazz festival. Well, guess what, ladies and gentlemen? The European uh, jazz scene has grown up very nicely on its own. And it doesn't mean that they are any less um, valid than we are. This is improvisational music that we all share together. So going back to, um, to my colleague's point here about being ready to play this festival, 
there is a difference between what we call soft ticket events and what we call hard ticket events. And a soft ticket event is something that's branded. I mean, Fritz has had his festival for a very long time, and he has a loyal audience that knows that even if they don't know the artists, they go to the Vienna Jazz Festival or the Umbria Jazz Festival, there's enough trust um, with the promoters of this, these long-standing festivals that you're going to see something you really love or you're going to discover new talent. So that's a soft ticket event. It's the event itself that's bringing you into it. The rock festivals have been doing this for years. Um, and a hard ticket event is when someone's going to decide to spend $15 or 15 euros to go out and see you rather than stay home and watch a movie on TV. You have to do both. So when you want to play a festival, the positive thing is that you will get in front of people who will discover your talent. What you want to do in addition to that is play hard ticket events so that you can start to build your market and you start getting people who definitely want to come out and see you. So what should you do first? Well, if you want to get immediate exposure and if you're ready, you've got your, permit, your publicity materials together, you've got your rider is clear, you understand how to travel in Europe, you've got all your stuff together, and you can get on a festival because you've convinced the promoter that you have something really interesting to offer, and you realize by researching this festival that you can fit on the Congo stage because you have a danceable kind of thing that everybody will love, then you need to make the most out of that performance opportunity. And you need to make every gig count. And then you want to return to that market maybe in six months or so before it completely fades. And you want to go and play a hard ticket event at Porgy and Bess or at some small venue in Vienna so that you can continue to build your audience and build on the experience that people have seen. Well, I mean, it was really very uh, precise analysis of that. The just can agree uh, with everything uh, what Catherine is saying. Uh, I mean, it's uh, it's uh, but but to get more into that uh, this hard ticket or soft ticket uh, uh, situations, uh, you know, the, the 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 problem is really that uh, that uh, uh, I mean, people in Vienna still are adventurous enough to go and see. Uh, names that they've not heard of and the trust uh, and the credibility that we have. Uh, but still, as you speak about the long-term uh, observation and your long-term in business, uh, this is one of the things we still have to stimulate, uh, uh, you know, to and stimulate again, you know, like the, the curiosity, you know, that people come and see something uh, new because this is another thing uh, what, is, what is important to know and you all know it, of course, that there's such an overflow and, uh, and uh, I mean, enormous uh, cultural uh, programs and concert uh, lineups and uh, whatever offered that people, uh, I mean, they have only, I don't know, X hours uh, free time to go to concerts and the budget of uh, uh, X amount of dollars to spend for the tickets. So uh, uh, important for us is to keep this adventurous uh, element up. I mean, is it for the how we market it, how we uh, present it, how of course how we make our our choices and uh, and uh, and uh, you know just to throw out a couple of other uh, elements what we have to consider that you get the bigger picture of our side where we are in. So you guys bring up a couple of interesting points. One has to do with being present in a market in a couple of different ways. One of the challenges that I think a lot of artists and, and managers have, though, is getting that first gig in a market. How do you do that so that you can start to carve a little little place out? And, and concurrent to that is if you get that first gig, how much exclusivity issue do you have in order to get the second gig? Well, I think you should be planning far in advance. I mean, one of the reasons that I see a lot of artists that I've worked with over the years not succeed or not get to the, where they want to be in terms of their goals is they can't make a plan. You know, you've got to make a plan. You can change the plan. But if you don't have a plan, then you don't have a way to get to where you want to go. So I think that 
you know, six months before you're going to go and play someplace, say you get a, get a gig at, you know, Pizza Express in London, you need to be working that market. You need to make sure that you've contacted people in the media and tell them you're coming. Do your social media. I mean, that stuff didn't, didn't exist when I was a musician. You know, it's, there are a lot more tools available to you now, and actually, it's my opinion, and, and actually, grant, um, drawing on the program for this Congress, there are so many things that are like DIY. Mm -hmm. Learn how to do it for yourself, because there's not anybody who's going to care about your career as much as you will, right? So it's, this is the business part. You got the music thing going on. You got to learn the business part if you really want to come to the table. And I also think that the point needs to be made, um, I always believe anyway, that the thing you get by working as a jazz musician from your audience is you get loyalty. Because it's improvisational music, every time somebody goes to do a show, they're going to see something different. As opposed to pop music, where you want to hear that same lick that you heard on the record. And people come and go, and bands come and go so fast in the pop industry. But if you take the time to nurture and develop your audience, assuming that you have an audience, they'll stick with you. They'll follow you for years. And you end up, what, you, what I'm, my point is, what you give up in terms of size of audience, you get back in terms of loyalty. And it really has to do with the nature of the music that we're talking about. So as um, Karen's talking about, think long term. This is a marathon, it's not a race. And if you do it right the first time, it will get easier, it really will. And off the back of that, you know, in my, in my experience, it seems that jazz is shedding its connotation of old and stuffy as time goes on. And more and more jazz programmers are taking more and more risks. I mean, these are people who are music heads who love to discover and dig in and find something that's different and unique. And so it gives independent jazz musicians an advantage in that sense because those buyers and programmers are probably more, more keen to press play as long as, like Fritz said, you don't have an email with 10 gigabytes of attachments. So I think there's, there's also specific scenes popping up in New York and in London right now that are super exciting to tap into and that are quite accessible. I mean, you see what the Ezra Collective guys have done with Steam Down in London. And, you know, I'm not aware, but I, I, I really want to help pioneer something like that in New York where there's kind of like a weekly or bi-monthly jam session for just anybody who plays jazz to pick up the sticks and drum or go play guitar or whatever. You know, I want that to exist here more and more, but there are opportunities here in New York. Um, Alex Curland, what he's doing with programming the late nights at Blue Note Jazz Club. I mean, that's a club that used to only book the older generation stuff, and now he's bringing in rappers and all different s sorts of genres to play sets at that historical of a club. And, you know, I think there's always slots that are obtainable, like The Bitter End um, or Rockwood, you know, for artists that are very, very early on. So I think this world is opening up to be more and more about collaboration and improvisation, um, more so than it ever has before. And I think it is difficult and challenging to take that first step, but if you get a good kind of agent or someone in the mix who has their kind of finger on the pulse, it can help navigate those waters for you early days. So you bring up something, or maybe it's just listening to all of you guys, and I'm thinking about artists um, who have a band, consider themselves a band leader. And what comes first? Is it that you have your idea in your head, you know what you want to do. How important is it for those artists to actually work with other bands, travel to Europe, Asia, South America, Canada, um, with someone else to help, on someone else's dime, if you will, on someone else's name, if you will, but to be able to do your research in person and leave your mark in person to also help prepare you to then launch with your own band? I don't think it's necessary, but I think it's very important um, and helpful. So one of my clients, Braxton Cook, um, he's like a 25, 26 year old saxophonist, went to Juilliard, he's got his own band now. He spent the last four years touring the world with Christian Scott and Marquise Hill, and he's now a member of Tom Mish's North American band. And he's still a young kid, but that experience that he had on the road, seeing how the pros do it, I mean, that's 
irreplaceable, you know? So he, he has a leg up because he's been able to kind of get out there and put himself out there. Not to mention just the interaction and the experience it gives you, you know, traveling overseas at that level. You know, then when, it, when, the, when you're the headlining name, you're just that much more ready and prepared. First, does it make a difference to you as a presenter to have had someone appear repeatedly on stage so that you sort of have an idea of what that person brings to the table? I mean, not necessarily, if I have to say, from the point of, of I mean, of course, the experience to deal with uh, somebody who has a basic experience and not start from uh, a square one uh, is uh, helpful and makes our work much easier when it comes to uh, production and so on. But otherwise, uh, I have to say from the point of view, really, that uh, somebody was never in town when I speak of Vienna, not, not as a co-musician or as a sideman or whatever, is much more interesting uh, uh, than, uh, than somebody who already, okay, he was in Vienna playing with this band, with this artist, he was here within this series and so on. So from the point of view, really, to have a, a novelty, it's... Uh, it's uh, it's it's better not to, you know, to be like an empty, unmarked uh, page or whatever. Well, that's encouraging, because that that says if you have something to say and it's and it's clear and it's well branded and it's unique, you can do that. There's a, there's a place for that, and there's 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 welcome arms. I think that's something that we all all are happy to hear. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, people are well traveled. They know how to travel. I mean, say somebody never played uh, uh, extensively uh, throughout the world. Is it in clubs or you know different countries, different continents? So I mean, handling like the logistics is not uh, not rocket science in that sense. And then the festivals, uh, they all have a, a, a very good uh, and very well organized staff. Is it from? Uh, uh, transportation from airport pickups, uh, uh, then to, you know, sound check, uh, logistics, and so on. So it's, uh, I mean, uh, of course, when it comes then to the stage presence and somebody is very shaky and unexperienced and uh, and uh, unsafe, and you put uh, uh, a, a very unexperienced uh, a person then on a, maybe on a big stage, then it's starting to to be co uh, counterproductive uh, to all parts, you know, to the festival producer and to the artist as well, because, you know, then the word goes around, well, you know, to unexperienced, no charisma and no whatever, you know, all the first impressions are then. No? So I'm curious to know what would, um, why would you take a chance on someone who is just starting out or who is new to you? For each of you, why would you take a chance? Why would you sign someone to your agency? Or why would you want to represent someone who, um, or, pre or present someone who um, isn't well known and is new to the market? Number one, how does the music make you feel? Does it give you goosebumps? Because if it does, then I'm picking up the phone and I'm calling first thing. I think number two is, do they have a manager? Is there a team around them? Am I gonna have to be babysitting this person? How old are they? Um, not that age matters, but you know, it's a factor. Um, so it's really you know, the art first, but then who's the team around them? Because oftentimes that can really show you how real this is so far. I would agree to that, with that to some degree. I've had um, the privilege of launching the careers of several artists. Um, and I'm not gonna bore you with that because this isn't really about me. I work for the artist, so I'm a worker bee. It's not, I'm not the star of the show here. But I think that if I hear some music and I understand where I can, where it would work, because I understand the market and I'll say, hmm, you know, this is really different and this probably would work in Italy. I could probably sell this in Italy. Or this is, um, we're trying to develop, on my roster, we're currently, um, it's majority are, um, jazz artists, but we're trying to develop more Americana artists and a few world music acts. So I can say, oh, you know, this is, this is something that could probably work in some of these other festivals. And as an agent and a business owner, that allows me to work with different sectors of the market. I mean, Fritz has had so many of my artists. Umbri has had so many of my artists. I mean, you want to be able to um, work with different kinds of people in the industry um, so that you can kind of expand the brand of your of your agency as well. What's the best way to, I shouldn't know, let me rephrase that. It's not the best way, but what 
what appeals to you when an artist approaches you? What makes them a professional? What makes them, um, I understand your point about the music, it has to be interesting and, and somehow you have to connect with it, but, but what are some of those things that an artist has to do to get your attention? Don't be a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> Please you know, expand. if I tell you, honestly, I mean, I'm with Fritz on these emails that I get that have all these links, and someone ha doesn't respect my time enough to check to make sure their links work. If you have a link in your email, and i got to click on that to go to a Dropbox, I mean, I'm not going beyond that. You don't have to send so much information. And I was raised to be polite to people, and if I tell you that I can't do anything for you, please respect that. I'm being honest with you, and I feel very strongly about this because I was a professional artist for 15 years, and I understand. I see it on both sides, and I feel your pain. I understand that it's really hard to understand this industry, but again, I have to come back to the fact that there are so many resources available to you. Now, do your work. I mean, I don't... Um, I don't, like, like my colleague here was saying, I don't want to be your babysitter. You know, if you want to sit at the grown-ups table with me, come prepared. And the other thing, a lot of artists don't spend enough self-reflection to understand what they do. What do you do? What, what makes you special? You know, if you, if you can't describe that to me, how are you going to describe that to Fritz? How is he going to understand what it is that you're bringing that's going to make his festival interesting and, um, you know, that, that kind of thing. And I also think that it's, it's great if you have a manager. I've worked with a lot of artists that don't have managers. But if you're not going to have a manager, you really have to be responsible. And you have to take care of what you do. As many times when I've worked with people who don't have managers and they'll say to me, okay, so are you going to get my visas for Japan? No, I'm not going to do that for you. I will give you the information, but that's not my job. And um, what do you think about you know, somebody who wants me to help them with their record or whatever? I'm not a record producer. I'm an expert at what I do after 30 years of doing this. I'm not a record producer. I'm not a manager. I have my skill set, and that's why you need a team, as you're talking about, exactly. And I, th I think there's, um, it's, it's timely to understand that if you don't have a professional manager, then you have to be your own manager. That's right. And that requires some understanding about what a manager does and what exactly. they provide for you and the responsibilities and the, and the accountability that comes along with that. And if you are your own manager, then you have to put that professional hat on and not take offense uh, to what someone might say to you about your work. It's, you always hear the phrase, it's just business, and you have to respect that as, as well. And you should have gone to the management roundtable yesterday. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and speaking about that, so managers and agents and, and producers work fairly closely together. Um, I would be interested to hear from each of you guys, what is your pet peeve um, that managers or representatives sort of come to you with so that we can avoid that? Well, the concept of a deadline has just basically lost all of its meaning. Until an artist actually confirms something, I mean, promoters let me know if I'm wrong, but you guys set a deadline. If I don't have an answer for you as an agent, all of a sudden the deadline miraculously appears one week later and one week later and one week later. And it's also frustrating for us as agents. I mean, we don't want to have to ch be chasing people around and around for answers. So I think... I'm, I'm, I'm just going to... Interrupt you. When you say a deadline, are you mean the so, deadline that's set forth by the agent? Yeah. So when I get an offer from Umbria and it says the deadline is January 18th, all of a sudden it's January 18th. I don't have an answer. Oftentimes that offer does not go away. So it's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's like as long as the promoters keep the offer valid, I'm not going to give you an answer. You know. So a pet peeve of mine is just the miscommunication that comes from artists and managers in actually confirming offers by the deadline. And oftentimes that comes down to us as agents making the strategy clear, why are we playing this show? What will this do for our careers? What's the next step? And that's how you can likely get a clear answer by the deadline. But I just think the concept of deadline has become kind of a joke 
in getting answers on offers. <laughs> I can't disagree with that more. I'm sorry. Because my concept of how I work with ev all the promoters I work with is that we are collaborators and we're partners. And I think it's a respect issue. If someone gives you a deadline, I will say to a manager, you have until you have you know, a week to come back to me with an answer on this, and then I really can't guarantee that this offer is going to still exist. Mm -hmm. The pet peeve that I have is um, working managers, working on tour periods, and then the tour periods don't happen. Mm. And all that work, all that six months of work that I just spent booking a tour for someone just goes away. I mean, you can't, people have babies, you know? I mean, people have other things going on in their life, a sick parent and they have to cancel their tour. But that is another thing where, I mean, I don't take this stuff personally because it really is a business to me. Well, when I talk about respect, I'm talking about respects on both sides of the table. If I respect you as an artist, you have to respect my time as well. You have to respect what the manager is probably juggling five or six artists. You have to respect that the promoter has, has publicity des deadlines and has things that if you can't respect their, their time, then you don't, you're not gonna have the same collaborative relationship that you really wanna have with someone. Well, Catherine, you're so wonderful, old school uh, agent uh, that admits, no, 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 in, in the very positive sense uh, that you call and say, okay, uh, is artist, uh, uh, you just name it, uh, free on July 5, you say yes, and then you negotiate the deal, you go back after some days and confirm uh, versus uh, the big agencies, you know, they work more the rock and roll system now, that means the agents, they're pitching. Noah is uh, an exception, I have to point out. Julie and the company as well. Uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, they're pitching and maybe the dates are happening, maybe the two is not happening. I have sometimes confirmations and go out on sale and then uh, some days later the, the confirmation is recalled and uh, the two is not happening and so on. So this is, you know, some real bad, uh, bad uh, nightmare for us. But coming to the, to the deadline, I mean, for us, giving an offer, you know, starts to this kind of uh, huge agency concept uh, is starting a business process, you know, that means uh, uh, you are the agent in the world that July 5 is kept, uh, you know, until an answer is coming if you don't put the deadline into it, you know. So if you don't put January 18 as a deadline, and, uh, you know, I already booked, and in May, another artist, you can come back in May to me and say, hey, you know, we've been, you know, you gave me an offer for, you know, the July 5, and I want to come back and pick up that offer, while when January 18 had passed, there's a deadline, I can say, hey, you got the deadline uh, January 18, so, you know, I'm legally off the hook as well. Safeguard no? in a way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Makes sense. So, so, Catherine, you mentioned collaboration, and I want to expand about on that for a minute. Um, how much development do you do with working with an artist, with a manager? Um, maybe less so in terms of produ and producers because you know, there's a multitude of those, but in terms of, of um, when you sign someone to your agency, do you have um, sit downs where you actually, you mentioned planning, but are, are there times which you really discuss about what the future may hold? Uh, what does this artist, you know, what are their goals? How, how do they want to move forward? And do those happen at regular intervals? Is it something that you come back to every, every year? How, how does that work? Um, I, uh, I think in the jazz industry, the, the agent and the manager are really so intertwined. I think in the pop industry, in the rock industry, and I have limited experience, but I did work with a couple of big artists in that, in that side of the, um, of the industry, it's much more defined because you really have, if you take on a big artist, they've got a business manager, they've got a manager, they've got a publicity team, they got like a whole you know caravan of people that look after that artist. And I think that what I generally do is I try to make 18 to 24 month plans with people. We decide where do you wanna be in two years and we work backwards mm -hmm. from there to make a plan to achieve that goal. And the way that I work is, I mean, it's just very simple. It's market, venue, and money. 
I mean, this comes up with the other question about collaboration, okay? If I know that I want to play in Carlo's Morlocky Theater, which is about 800 capacity, and he asked me how much money do I, six, 600 capacity, okay. <laughs> We just We're lost a lot of kills in that deal. <laughs> yeah, well. But the point is, if when I start to work with the promoter and they, t they ask me how much money do I want for an artist, I'm going to say, I want a million dollars. I want as much money as I can possibly get from you. Now let's talk about what your ticket price. Let's talk about what your capacity is. If you've got a 200 capacity venue and a 10 euro ticket price, you can do the math, it's not that hard. Why would I ask somebody for a $5,000 offer? It's a waste of time. So that might not be the right venue, or maybe it is the right venue. And um, so I think that um, when we're planning this, we're trying to, as, as Noah was saying, it's exactly right, you're trying to find the right markets, You know, make a list of the major markets in, in Europe, and think about the routing, because you don't want to give away all of your profit to the airline companies, think about what's the best venue you can play in that city, and then kind of the money will follow. I mean, it's, it's pretty, pretty much like that, and we try to do things, I, I'm a big believer now in regional touring, that you can do on a train, particularly if you're a developing artist. And so you try to think about going London, Paris, the Benelux, maybe Western Germany, and that might be enough because then, you know, that's, you have the time and the focus to develop those, those clubs and those regions and then go on to the next thing. And then you want to continue to build on this. So there is a lot of planning that goes into it. And I really want to look far enough in advance so that we can make every gig count. And it's like building a house or it's building your business. Think about it, it's your business. Get out of the idea of it, you're a musician. No, it, it's your business, it's a small business. That's I, how you have to look I, at I'm, it. I'm always talking to a lot of young artists when I teach and I always say you're in the, you are the president of me and you have to think of yourself as a corporation, it puts a different hat on and it forces you to look at budgets. And I think that's really critical what, what Catherine is saying, and what Noah is saying too, is you have to start with a budget. You have to know not just what the capacity is in terms of a venue, you also have to understand what your value, is, your, your perceived value is to a market. We all want to be able to make those, you know, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar gigs, but you have to be realistic. If the market is saying I can only afford to pay you eight hundred dollars, then you have to figure out, all right, how many eight hundred dollar gigs do I need in order to make it so that I can afford to get the train tickets and not the plane tickets, or to rent a van. Because there's always ways to resolve the problem. It's just how creative can we be? In, in resolving it. But I, I think I think the, the point of, I, I see myself doing things a little bit differently differently now than when I did a few years ago. I, I now, I do a budget always. Whenever an agent brings a um, an offer to me, the very first thing I do is I figure out how much is my transportation. And, and most of our budgets are 50% based on transportation. It used to be about 30% of a budget, but now it's 50% of a budget. You have to be willing to, to do that and understand what you have to spend on your requirements. And your requirements are transportation, you know, accommodations, and salaries. And it doesn't mean your salary, it's the salary of your side musicians. Oftentimes you don't get paid. If you have a manager, it may be that the manager doesn't get paid if they're really invested in your future. But it, but it really is helpful to understand from a budget standpoint. Go ahead. An interesting example of that is I work with Corey Henry, and amazing guy, amazing musician. Um, he's also the type of guy that loves to kind of bite off more than he can chew. <laughs> and to me, that's a big challenge. Um, he obviously had his history with Snarky Puppy, and he won the Grammys with them, and he's very reputable in, in the jazz and funk and soul worlds and gospel worlds. Um, he had this grand idea to put together a nine-piece band called the Funk Apostles, and we toured that for a year and a half, and they're incredible. They take the audience to church every performance. It's amazing, but what comes with nine people on stage is a lot of expenses. And, I mean, the guy plays a B3 Hammond organ. It costs over $2,000 to rent that thing in northern Finland, you know? <laughs> so... 
taking into account backline costs and travel and, I mean, tax, a lot of people look at a number and they don't, oh, there's 35% that's going to be taken off that. I mean, that can be, that can make or break whether a tour is profitable or not. So with Corey, we've actually scaled it down to a point where we're still going to be touring the Funk Apostles this summer for festivals, the ones that can hopefully pay, you know, 25 grand over here. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> But we've also started to tour him as a duo and as a trio. And so it's Corey Henry at the core. People want to see Corey. They're not going to see his second backup singer. She's amazing, but they're going to see Corey. So we've kind of flipped it on its head, and it's now the revival featuring Corey Henry and Tehran Lockett, who's this amazing drummer. And we're doing a six-week tour in Europe that started yesterday in Tel Aviv. And... Corey's the type of artist who will play 40 shows in 30 days if, if you book it that way, and he'll do it with a smile on his face. And he wears a hoodie that says booked, because he's <laughs> literally always booked. Good. But as an agent, you almost have to kind of pull the reins in a little bit, because artists, they just want to work, especially in the jazz world. They love to be on stage. They love to perform and do their craft and, and share that with people. But as the professional team member around them, you kind of have to look out for their own sanity and their health and say, we want this to be a 50 year touring business, not a two year touring business and then you're in rehab for five, you know? You so, bring up a really good point and, and part of it has to do with, and I think that's true, the, the responsibility of the team, whether you have an agent or a manager or someone who just cares about you. Um, it's, as artists, we do want to work all the time, but it's not necessarily healthy for you uh, physically, it may not be healthy for you career-wise because you're playing, and even if there are no exclusivity issues around your performance space, in your, in your long-term plan that Catherine's referring to, you have to look at, well, does this really make much sense? I could play the jazz standard and the blue note within three months, but is that going to be taxing the audience that I'm trying to develop? Mm. Exactly. Am I going to be engendering goodwill or not so goodwill amongst those presenters? Exactly. Because you do have to think of put yourself in the place of, the, of the, all the people who are helping you get that gig. And it's, this is a relationship business. I, I think we all know that, that's why we're here. But I think to your point earlier, Kathy, you keep mentioning the word respect. We always want to be respected. But how do we actually show others that we respect what they do? How do we, how do we demonstrate that? Um, in terms of what? In, in terms of how we, well, specific, specifically in terms of, of, of this topic, how we interact with presenters and agents and those, the crew who helps to put, put these put these events on, the publicists, all those people around. How do we demonstrate respect? Be professional. Show up on time. Do your sound check when you're supposed to do your sound check. You know? Um, and nothing is perfect on the road. You know? You are going to have times when the bus is not going to pick you up on time. You know? Don't throw a fit. You know? It's... That's what your life is going to be like if that's what you choose to do. If you talk to people who are serious road warriors like John Schofield, he's seen every single thing you can possibly think of. And he still goes out there, and it's not, it's not the audience's fault if something went wrong. He's there to play for them, you know. Be professional. I can't underline that enough. Under, does everyone know what a writer is? Yeah. Do you all have one, those artists? Is it clear? Yeah. Does it talk about brands? Is it specific? Does it have the brand of microphone that is best suited for you? Does it have a substitution in case yes. you don't have it? Does it talk about what you can and cannot eat? Yes. Okay. Pain. Does it have red wine or white wine? Depends upon my <laughs> client, but that, that's in there. <laughs> well, you're right, because not everyone has that in there. But, but there is this understanding of you have to be specific about the information. I was just telling this story about I have, I have a client who was asked to play at a, at a venue, and um, their instrument isn't provided at the venue. That's okay if that instrument is transportable. But if it's not transportable, you have to know that whether that venue has that as part of their established backline. And if it isn't, then either that's not the venue for you or you have to make other accommodations. 
but that's back to the the knowledge uh, or excuse me the the um, homework that you have to do and it also comes down to your network I mean I think in in the jazz world oftentimes musicians will have friends and colleagues and peers in cities all over the world so it's great to stay on people's good side so that you can call in that favor for a drum kit real quick if you ever need it you know and on, on a bigger scale there's there's companies like Yamaha and Roland that will do um, backline bartering deals for a bit of social media posts I mean you know not everybody here has the six-figure following on Instagram we all want it obviously but when you get to that level for example with Jacob and Yamaha I mean his backline alone would be like four grand a night and there, that's, a, that's a loss if he has to pay for his backline. So Yamaha has agreed to provide him, you know, one kit for America when he tours, one kit for Europe when he tours. So there, there's conversations you can navigate with backline suppliers. And I don't think it's ever too early to get on their radar. It, it's not. Um, I, I represent James Francis, who's a, a developing artist. But even before we did our first gig, um, I got him an endorsement deal with Yamaha. He has an endorsement deal with Chord because he plays keyboards. Those instruments companies want to have relationships with artists that they feel are going to be good representatives of their product. So you have to make sure you match it, but it's never too early to ask. I have one last question before we open this up for um, Q&A. And that is, is sort of a, gen a general question. And I'm just curious to know what inspires you to expand jazz beyond its original birthplace? Anybody? Uh, these guys. <laughs> well, I got into this business purely out of loving music. I graduated from college and I said, what am I going to do with my life? I don't, do I get into PR? Do I get into finance like half of my, you know, fraternity brothers did? And I said, hell no. I, I want to be happy. I want to be excited about waking up every day. I want to be broke. <laughs> <laughs> you got to take that risk though, you know, to do what you love, you have to take that risk. And then the payoff is that much bigger, you know? So like, I think the reason I got into this business was out of love for music, and I might be completely jaded because I'm still pretty young, and in 10 years I might not have this answer. <laughs> but, um, you know, I do it for the connection that I have with my clients and for the artists. And for me, it's about developing something that's long term, you know, not necessarily finding it from ground one, but stage one, but that helps. Um, but just being a, a vital part of building something and sharing that art with the world. I mean, music is, it's the cliche, but it's the universal language. It's what breaks down barriers. It's what, you know, people in militaries that are fighting against each other can nod their head to the same exact beat. You know, it unifies us all. And so I think that love and power of music is what got me into this business. Luckily, I've been fortunate to work with some great and exciting artists. And I think that definitely helps, you know, having a Jacob Collier on your roster is super exciting because he's so young and the, and the promise and the potential of building something long-term is there. So that definitely helps. But the root of it is because I love music. And if you don't have that fire, then go sell cars. <laughs> well done. So we're gonna open it up for questions. Um, if you have one, please stand here at the microphone. Remember my home rules. One question, name only, shoot it out. If you, have, if you want to direct it to somebody, feel free. It's a little hard to ask. But, and you have to speak into the microphone. Okay. And, and, and by the way, if you have a statement, keep that for the end. If you have a question, we want to hear from you. It's a question, but I have to tell something to go with the question. You, you, have, you have 15 seconds. Okay. I've had about 55 to 60 dates in France. I want to travel to somewhere else. I'd like to go to Italy. I want to travel to Sweden. I'd like to go to other places. I, help me, tell me something so that I can get to other countries. I love France, they've been great, but I'm ready to go. Do you, uh, <laughs> Good point. Do you perform in French? Uh, no, I don't, but they still love me. Why? Um, because I think my brand, I'm all about the glam. Like I bring a lot of glam, I do costume changes. Mm. I do the, I give a show mm. and that's what I like. And I, I just, that's me. So that's you're authentically brain. you. That's, I'm me. That's it. This right here, this is me every day. Have you tried in those surrounding countries to perform yet? I have, you know, when you write letters to strangers and this is great because I'm learning so much here. Maybe I didn't write the right way mm. or because sometimes you don't hear anything. So you don't know whether they got it, did they not get it? I don't so I, I just want to ask Catherine to, to answer that question because you talked about regional, you know, really working the region, and I, she's about expanding 
that region. I think one of the things you should do is get on the internet and find another artist that's similar to what you do mm -hmm. and look and see where they're playing. Okay. That will help you start to find the venues that might be appropriate for you. Okay. There's also um, uh, industry things like Polestar, which has, uh, they publish um, directories of clubs and things like that. Um, are, are you a jazz artist? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So there's also a really great um, uh, conference in Bremen, Germany, every April called Jazz Ahead. And Excellent. it's it's huge now, um, and it 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 you can meet a lot of people there. I mean, it's a big trade fair, and they have they have showcases yeah. you can apply to do a showcase, that kind of thing. But I think you have to do your research. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm a jazz artist. I book myself and I manage myself, and I play venues from 50 people to an outdoor. 2,000 people show that is free to the public. To me, the, one of the black boxes is figuring out the money, what to ask for, because we know that some of those things are ticketed, some of those things are based on grants and donations, and this is a job like any other. <laughs> so um, I am eager, I wanna pay, I will pay for $50, mm -hmm. you know. That's what I want to do. I want to be on the road, but I also need to make a living. So I'm curious from all of your perspectives, um, from the presenter and from an agent, how do you figure out the offer and negotiate the offer, um, regardless whether in your head you're just thinking, just give me the gig, <laughs> I'll come and play. You know, what's, uh, what's realistic? What's, how do you the nuance of that negotiation and nuance of understanding what you can ask for um, and, and how you can ask for it, you know? Thank you. Besides the financial component, mm -hmm. I would first look to make sure that everything on the ground is covered by the promoter so that you're not mm -hmm. bleeding money when you get there and there's unexpected costs, right? So mm -hmm. making sure that hotel and show-related right. ground and backline and your rider is taken care of so that mm -hmm. literally when you touch ground, hopefully everything's taken care of. If not, making mm -hmm. and setting aside a specific budget for those costs will help you stay in the black. Mm -hmm. But then I think based on the fee that you should quote is look at what you're earning everywhere else. Um, look at any history you have in those markets and what you earned there. And in my opinion, if you feel that you have the leverage, aim high, ask for a little bit more. Cause mm. it's hard to go back up after you say a specific yeah. number. So as an agent, I try to be aggressive, but mm. not, not to put anybody off. Know what your costs are is what the point I think that was made earlier. Know what those costs are so that you don't agree to something that you can't possibly fulfill. You should also always be ready to take a loss. And a loss might mean not making any money. Right. But usually you're going to be the last person paid. Thank you for your question. Hi, my name is Judith. Um, the question is about age. I lived and worked in the south of France for about 28 years, came back to the States three years ago, and I'm just restarting my career. And I've heard a lot of talk about, you said age doesn't matter. And I've heard a lot of talk about long-term young musicians. What about those of us who are good, experienced, seasoned, I heard that word, and we're not 25 or 30, mm -hmm. and we want to work? Yeah. I'm a singer, and I would love, also love to get back to Europe, which is why I'm, I'm here on a tour or or playing, mm. but also here, I live in New York. Mm -hmm. you know, what is your opinion about us? Thank you. Should I answer yes, that? Yes, you should. Since I'm <laughs> as old as dirt. Um, <laughs> You're not as old as I am. <laughs> <laughs> you look fine, lady, you, you look great. <laughs> I, don't, I think that, um, that jazz is one of the markets where I think age is not as much of an issue myself. I think if you are um, a good musician, I think you just, you know, you just put your best foot forward and do it. The thing I like about music is, um, and what I always felt when I was a musician myself, is it's a very black and white kind of thing. You either can sing or play or you can't. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very, uh, it, it, it's, it's a very, um, you know, as I say, I think it separates people very, very quickly. 
And I think if you if you are, I wouldn't be afraid to go out there and, I mean, I would still do gigs if I had time, but I don't. But, you know, just get your stuff together and figure out your marketing and figure out your social media and just go for it. I, I, and to add to that, it goes back to branding. If you're very clear about who you are, what makes you unique, mm -hmm. and that that uniqueness has a place to be heard, mm -hmm. that's what you're selling. You're not selling your age, you're not selling your color, you're not selling your, your gender. You're selling yes. your talent. And, yeah, and it's, it's many, many examples in the music world that, uh, that uh, the age doesn't matter at all. I mentioned Charles Bradley, who started his career with 60. I mentioned the Buena Vista Social Club yeah. that started like 85. Yes. Compay Segunda was sure. 95, <laughs> you know. So it's uh, plenty of examples. So I think it's not absolutely not, especially as Catherine says, not in the field of jazz, you know. It's also about you as agents or managers uh, or, or presenters, how you look at it, you know, because you're looking at long term or whatever. So that answer, that answer fits for you too? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Your answers. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. I managed Kenny Barron. I started managing him when he was 55. Thank you. So, thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Candice. Um, I'm a vocalist and I, I'm in charge of my band. But um, I have a question. If we have material that we're preparing, we have an album, we have um, all our information, we kind of are, are setting ourselves up. We're still independent. We're, we don't have any managers or agents. What are some of the resources that we can do to outreach to a manager or to an agent? Identify the managers and the agents that you want to meet with, you know? Look at your contemporaries, the other artists out there, who manages them? What are the companies, you know, that you should be reaching out to? I think there's also certain, like, curating platforms, like Pick Up Jazz, for example, which is something that I love and everybody should check out. The parent company is called Pick Up Music, but they also have an Instagram account called Pick Up Jazz, and they're just amazing at A&R and finding things literally from, from the ground floor up. Um, and so, Interacting with those communities within Pickup Jazz, using Instagram to literally just direct message other artists that you're fans of and just starting a dialogue and creating a relationship, you'd be amazed at what kind of what that can kind of create and the wave and momentum that that can kind of create. So I would just get out there within your scene as much as possible. Have conversations with other artists, you know, in your world and see who, who's on their team. And are there any like websites or anything that you can recommend? I mean, for just I mean, artists who are just starting. There, there are guides out. Whether it's jazz published by Jazz Times or Jazz Is, I give give you. You know, there are educational guides because you have to remember that um, you know Gail Boyd runs this this um, Facebook page called Alternative Venues for Jazz. We have to look beyond a festival or a club mm -hmm. or a performing arts center. There's so many different ways. Someone was talking this morning in the in the uh, granting session about um, Woodlawn Cemetery. And it makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it is about doing your homework, but look at, you can start there. And use the network that already exists, your friends. You should be performing with the musicians that you know. That's where you get tidbits, that's where you get referrals. If you wanna to come to the attention of an agent or, or a manager, you have to work on developing your buzz, and your buzz starts with street cred. It's a really Thank good you. point. Thank you. Just one quick thing. Yeah. Like, as an agent, I get 10 to 20 emails a day blindly from artists, and it could be the next Adele, but I don't always press play just simply because of time, you know? And so having that one mutual contact to make the introduction and open the door for you can be the difference. So making sure it's not unsolicited is right. important. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi, my name is Alicia. Um, just a quick little backstory. We start, I mean, the single of a duo of bass and voice. We started our business doing um, jazzy renditions of popular tunes. Everyone seems to love it, especially the international people that see us. But for festivals, um, is, it, are, is, is, I guess, doing covers in a fun way welcomed by those audiences or is strictly original work? Well, I mean, festivals have uh, several stages, you know, there are festivals with 16 stages and <coughs> big venues, small venues, uh, clubs, <coughs> excuse me. So it's many, many possibilities. 
but uh, uh, I wanted to say now it's uh, it's maybe preferred to have uh, no cover versions but original versions is maybe not true you know it depends on uh, how your arrangements are how your presentation is uh, there are many artists that live just of uh, cover versions you know like for example when I see Seal's performances, you know, like uh, two-thirds of his show are cover versions, you know, like songs written by other artists, but own arrangements and so on. So it depends on, you know, uh, really how it sounds. Right. Well, yeah. hmm? right. Thank well, we'll you. We'll do to it then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Faith Amore, and this is very nerve-wracking. I lost my nerve a second ago, but... <laughs> but you're here speaking. And yes, ma'am. Um, so my question is, uh, to make a little bit of a case study of it, wow, my heart, um, if you say, okay, so I would love to play in your venue or play at your festival, you say, what do you charge, um, you respond back with what, if it's hard tickets, um, so if it's $20 that they say for the tickets and 200 seats, for example, we got $4,000 that would be coming in. Um, so should we aim to say perhaps like 50% of that should make everyone feel well about the arrangement? I know it's probably a little bit different for each presenter or each person who's um, making those decisions, but um, it's hard, for, like if we have a little bit even more specific guidance in that sense, I think that would help a lot of us that are doing the booking ourselves to know what is asking too much. And what is more on the reasonable side? What would make them feel comfortable like we can continue this conversation as opposed to, you're crazy. <laughs> Good question. Yeah, Good question. You. I think what you're talking about is actually um, spot on because it's understanding the financial aspects of the deal. The thing is that um, this is all about managing risk, right? The risks that the promoter's taking to, because it isn't just the amount of money you get paid for the show. Mm -hmm. They have to do publicity. They probably are going to feed you something. There's there are show costs associated with it. So even if it's a even if they pay you a, a thousand bucks, their show costs are at least double that. Um, so I think when it comes to sometimes if I don't know what to ask for artists, and again you know I mean I've been doing this for a long time, but I generally would say I would give people um, the ability to engage in the discussion. My past fees have been between $1,000 and $1,500. I'm very interested in the opportunity. Please, can you tell me what you think would be possible? You know, try to get people to engage with you. Um, Noah had a good point in that um, you do with, with artists that are established and that you work with all the time. You may want to push the fee a little bit if they're coming back for the third time into the market because you can always come down. You can't go up. So, um, and then there's all, there's a lot of um, nuance about how to do deals. You can go in for a lower guarantee and then say once you satisfy all the expenses, which we call the break even, once you get to the break even, then let's share in the profits. You know, um, I'm not a big fan of doing 50-50 deals. Mm -hmm. I would feel like the artist should get paid a better, per a bigger percentage of, um, of the profit, but I mean, you can do that, and that shows a willingness to share the risk with the promoter. But starting with some kind of guarantee. Right. Yeah, well, you can suggest a guarantee, or you can ask them, you know, to make a proposal to you, and then you can, then you already have an idea as to what they think you're worth in the market, and then you can talk back and forth, and if you've played in that market, or if you know you have fans in that market, then you've got more leverage. You can say, you know, I can get 50 people to come to the show. You know, so it's all about managing risk. And this goes back to one of my first comments in the session is think like the promoter. Mm -hmm. Put your promoter hat on. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. Exactly. So would you say perhaps if you start with that maybe 50% of what's coming in, um, and this is what I've earned in the past, mm -hmm. having those statements essentially. Right. And and I think I think Catherine's point is it's a discussion. So try to try to respect what they have, be open to it, and then you, you'll make your decision. Ask them to send you a show budget. Ask them to send you a costing just to make it transparent so you can actually see what their costs are. They'll tell you what venue rent is. They'll tell you what barricades and security. There will be a line for they each of those. They do that? Yeah. 
Absolutely. That's how we well, work every will. day. Yeah, some will. Well, hopefully. But you guys, we have time for like one more question. Otherwise. Half a yeah. question. Is that phone calls I'm, and email? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut you off because we have one more question. You can talk to them afterwards. Hi. Hello. My name is Joanna Walfish. Um, this is an agent question, I guess, slash manager. So as someone who's done a lot of research into um, finding a team, building a team, um, I've looked at the artists that I look up to that I would say I'm similar, that I work in the genre realm of. But as representers, representatives, do you, even if you love, you know, you discover a new artist and you're like, well, you're really promising, you've got a lot of great work, a good body of work, but we already have an artist like you. Do you say, call me in 10 years when maybe we've moved on? Or do you take a chance? Like, where is your risk factor there? Do you want me to answer this? I think you have to be careful not to cannibalize your roster. If you have too many artists that are the same, then you're always deciding who's going to get that gig. Sure. Who's going to get that $2,500 gig? Um, and I think that um, I don't take any artists on my roster anymore, folks, um, that, that I can't. I have eight people that work for me. I can't take on artists that, that don't have any kind of an established uh, profile. Or if I take on someone who's starting from the very beginning, they need to come to the table and help make this happen. Mm -hmm. Like find a sponsor, like get a grant written, like do something, do education, do something that's going to help the finances of a tour. Because the thing that no one has brought up in this entire meeting is we are the facilitators. We can't put butts in the seats, right? right? And we can is, help you. Yeah. That is clearly the artist's responsibility, and you have to accept that. Develop your fan list. You guys, I'm sorry we're out of time. We really appreciate you for coming. I want to thank again Noah Simon. Catherine McVicker and Fritz Tom. All of a sudden, I have one of those brain farts. Thanks again. And um, Thanks before, Kennedy. thank you. You guys, instead of coming up to the table, because I know they had to clear the room, if you can meet outside, you can talk to them outside. Thank you.